the topic of the outline is how the biomass boilers that the school district is using are used for not only for the school heating, but also as a community development resource. They've done a whole bunch of these projects and they've been learning as they go. This is pretty kind of, I think it's kind of cool that they've done, uh, they're on their seventh project now and they actually did one project twice. So you could say they've done it eight times and they just keep getting better and better. And this, this plays right into the whole commissioning um, uh, process of uh, lessons learned, of uh, an owner's project requirement, the design intent, uh, the, the even understanding some of the technical and engineering aspects that go into a successful project. Uh, the learning objectives uh, are what a biomass boiler is. Second one is the lessons learned from previous projects. How the owner's project requirement uh, improved uh, from project to project. And then lastly, uh, how that has all improved the functional testing that they do uh, at the end of a project. So who are we? I'm Walter Hines. I'm an engineer and uh, a commissioning provider. And then Jonathan uh, Fitzpatrick, my co-presenter, is uh, the uh, project manager and uh, 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 facility uh, operations with the Southeast Highland School District. So biomass, what is biomass? Biomass is just about any kind of a homegrown fuel. You know, the, uh, there's been, wood is probably the most popular one, but I've seen uh, grass harvested for, uh, for fuel. Uh, uh, you've probably all heard about the, uh, the pioneers that burned cow dung, you know, and all that. That's all biomass. So uh, in the case of Prince of Wales Island, they have so much wood available and uh, handy, easy to, uh, to collect resource that it's, a, it's a natural for them to use uh, wood. As far as the community development goes, uh, the biomass boilers have done more than just change their heating costs and, uh, and the way they heat their schools. They, it's become a community development resource. It's opened up economic opportunities for students and uh, community members. Uh, students get involved with, this, uh, with the boilers and it can be a learning experience for them. It even has uh, f provided fresh vegetables for the ca local cafeteria. Uh, growing through experience, the school district has had multiple projects that they've learned from. The uh, project has kind of grown from its beginnings. It started out just as a biomass boiler and then they said, well, hey, we can do more than that. And uh, it continued to grow. And, and then, uh, of course, the lessons learned have uh, improved it as it grow, grew. The owner's project requirement is, has been really helpful for taking the lessons learned and applying it to the next project. Now, this is a sort of a thing that the district was doing, but they didn't really know that it was called an owner's project requirement. Uh, that's a commissioning term. And, uh, but it's a natural thing yeah, when you learn from experience. Uh, you want those lessons to uh, be recorded or at least applied. And then the testing, of course, all in, uh, is, boils down to getting what they wanted. Uh, if it didn't work, uh, it really, well, there'd be some lessons learned there, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be what they wanted. Jonathan Fitzpatrick. Uh, biomass project manager. He's uh, been involved with all these projects. He's uh, done the, uh, the planning, the budgeting. He gets involved with construction. Uh, he participated in the OPR development. Uh, he, uh, he's right now, I mean, not this minute, of course, but uh, in the, 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 the seventh project that they're building is in progress in a town called Heidelberg and he'll be heading back there soon to uh, continue working on that. He's also the boiler system operator and manager for the whole school district. As for me, I'm a consultant. 
Uh, I got involved with the Southeast Island School District uh, on one of their earlier projects and have been uh, facilitating the OPR and uh, assisting with the de design um, and I'd be participating in the commissioning uh, this summer when the Heidelberg School is ready for that. So Prince of Wales Island. Thank you Google Earth. This is a map of Alaska and Northwest Canada. Uh, let's see, right down here you'll see Prince of Wales Island. This is a whole archipelago of islands. It's, uh, gosh, I'm not even sure, maybe a thousand or eight hundred miles long, something like that. Prince of Wales Island is the largest island in that group. In fact, it's the fourth largest island in the United States. Uh, Prince of Wales Island is about 800, or, um, uh, 130 miles long, and these are the villages that have the biomass boiler projects in them, in their schools. One of the unique things about Prince of Wales Island is that all these villages are connected by a road system. So that's uh, uh, just a little factoid about Alaska. We have lots and lots of villages that are isolated. At least in Prince of Wales Island, they're connected. Another thing about Prince of Wales Island is that the whole thing from here to here, it's all forested, heavily forested with big cedar trees. So the combination of the cedar trees, the climate for fast regrowth, and the roads have made it possible for them to harvest the biomass. <clears throat> so learning objective number one uh, is understanding how the bio biomass boilers are being used. Uh, in the school and the community. What are biomass boilers? We're going to give you an example and show how they're being integrated. So what's biomass? Biomass is just about any kind of a burnable natural fuel. Uh, it comes in a lot of forms. Uh, the Southeast Island School District is using cordwood. Cordwood requires a little bit more manual handling than chips and pellets. Uh, the downside of chips and pellets is that you have to have a manufacturing plant to create it. And that can affect the economics greatly. Uh, it also uh, can actually kill the economics. But biomass can also be things like pressed bricks. There's a sawmill on Prince of Wales Island and they take their, they have a mountain of sawdust and they press them into bricks. You've probably seen a similar product in the grocery store. It's called the Presto Log. Um, these, are, uh, these bricks are being sold in hardware stores and are available. I think, Jonathan, you buy a, a ton a year or something like that? A couple tons a year. Yeah, okay. We use them to sub supplement, supplement our cord firewood. Right. Okay. Uh, even some things like processed sludge and uh, other biological matter have been experimented with. Wood boilers. What's a wood boiler? Well, they can be automated or manual, uh, just like uh, we were saying with the chips and the, and the pellets can be used an auger to feed the boiler and keep it burning at, at a variable rate all the time. Or it can be uh, manual, manually loaded with, by just chucking logs into the, into the uh, firebox. The uh, boiler systems themselves can, uh, are, are, are very adaptable to conventional hydronic heating systems, so you don't need to know much more than uh, the workings of the boilers and the uh, design of a boiler room to apply it to a school that's hydronically heated. And uh, bio, uh, wood boilers are almost always coupled with large thermal storage tanks. This is so that the, uh, the the tank can take over or level out some of the ups and downs of the firing rate of the boiler. Here we have a schematic design. This is just clipped out of a drawing of the boiler system. So I'm going to point out a couple of things. Um, this is the wood boiler assembly right here. It's uh, uh, boilers a heat exchanger, and a, some pumps. Uh, this section right here is the green section, is uh, uh, the piping that's inside the, the wood boiler room, the biomass boiler room. 
It includes some more pumps, some controls, a, a hydraulic separator, and uh, three branches, one that goes to each of the three schools. Now this yellow section, this is the piping that goes outdoors. It runs across the campus, one to each building. And in each building, we have another heat exchanger down here by the, the is that pink or purple, uh, the way it's showing here. Uh, another heat exchanger, and that heat exchanger is tied directly into the school buildings that have a conventional uh, oil-fired boiler. So uh, with that, I'm going to ask uh, Jonathan to come on up and uh, have a talk, or give you the talk about their schools and what they're doing with them. Well, I'll try to fit all this in in the short amount of time that I have to talk. Um, we, have, we have a lot going on in our schools. Um, my wife is also here. She's also the head of the greenhouse projects that uh, our uh, wood boilers had allowed us to go ahead and do heated. Greenhouses were normally, if we were using fossil fuels, heat in a greenhouse would be out of the question. So, um, let's see. Uh, well, this was the first wood shed that we built. It's in Kaufman Cove. Um, that we've, we've made changes to this wood shed. We've made changes to all our design since. Uh, our first uh, wood boiler that we commissioned, we asked the engineer, we want a wood boiler, we want wood storage. Uh, found out over the years our wood is so wet because of our 100 uh, inches of rain a year that now we have converted our wood sheds to more of an open pole building without walls on it so we can get free airflow through to uh, dry our firewood. So this is our, this is our wood facility in Kaufman Cove. Uh, okay, so the, uh, the Garn wood boiler units, you can, you can build them from scratch or you can order these, um, they call them a Garn pack where they, it's basically a plug and play. These were designed for more or less of, of the interior of Alaska where they can just be skidded in and hooked up and, and uh, so they gave them to us to go ahead and, and try. They were their first prototypes and uh, we used them for a couple years at this site. Then we um, determined that they weren't, they didn't quite have enough thermal storage at this site so we disconnected them, threw them on some trucks, took them to a smaller site. Uh, one of them actually sits inside of a greenhouse right now. It's, we have a 7,000 square foot greenhouse with a uh, aquaponic uh, fish growing system in it. So it, um, it heats all the water for the aquaponic system that they're uh, growing with. So, uh, that, that was our first boiler. You can see how we've built the building around that. Uh, let's see, where's this laser pointer? There it is. There's our boiler right there. There's two of them. There's one here and then there's one there. Um, so uh, we've changed our design over the years where um, this was obviously our, this is our first one. So we have our wood storage facility about 50 feet from the actual wood boiler building. We found out in the, in the future, it's best to have the wood storage and the wood boilers together in one building. You know, in the winter, you aren't forklifting in the snow 50 feet across the parking lot and moving firewood. Also, the heat from the boilers themselves will help dry out the firewood. So we have totally redesigned our, our system since then with our firewood storage being in the same building as the wood boilers. Um, with the, these are some uh, uh, plumbing hookups. We use uh, a double insulated Arctic pipe right here. So it's a supply and return line. It's got spray foam around it and then it's encased in this eight inch uh, flexible casing. So uh, some of our like down in Heidelberg, we put in about 1,200 feet of this type of pipe buried, you know, the, the boiler rooms from where our wood boiler is. We're far distances apart over to this school building, over to that school building. So we do put a lot of this type of piping underground. There's a, uh, another couple connection that'll be insulated and buried. Um, Right there, we also run a, a domestic water line out to our wood boiler buildings. And now that our greenhouses are also connected to the wood boiler buildings, that we have uh, water out there. 
Uh, this is one of our uh, heat exchangers. Uh, so some of our schools were already uh, had hydronic heating in them. So the, the tie-ins with the heat exchanger were real simple. You just tee into the lines in the school, run them through a heat exchanger. Um, school on one side of the heat exchanger, wood boiler on the other. Some of our other schools had no hydronic heating at all, so everything was done from scratch, you know, and installing the baseboards along the, along the walls and, and such. So these, these our, our newer schools already had hydronic heating in them, so the, the tie-ins were basically good. You can see uh, right in here we have circuit setters with uh, PT plugs for uh, balancing, balancing the system. Um, you know, it's very important to get it balanced. You don't want a, a lot of heat loss. Uh, so um, balancing, sometimes it can take us a couple days to get things balanced well once we're up and running and the boilers are up to temperature and the school is using it, so. Uh, okay, community. Uh, a good subject to touch on because uh, we all, all of our money used to go to diesel you know I mean we're talking some of our schools burn up to hundred fifty thousand dollars a year in diesel just for heat um, so that is now let's see what a switch here that money is now staying locally because we're um, you know it's provided a bunch of jobs uh, the the wood harvester that goes and gets the wood um, and then you have, you know, uh, the, the, the kids and the, the students, uh, a lot of our sites of kids and the students are actually, you know, hand feeding and loading the boilers themselves. And, uh, you know, so it's created the, the wood harvester has a job, the kids have a job, of course I have a job, you know, we've, we've created actually, you know, quite a good economy. Uh, with, with this biomass project where people didn't normally uh, would have an income. Uh, a lot of the things, like a lot of our students, some of our students, you know, might not have made it to graduation if they didn't come to school and have a job. So, you know, it really gave a lot of our students something to look forward to, to where they're at school and they're getting paid to load the wood boilers and gives them a little more in incentive to be there. Um, Here's, here's one of our students here. He, he ran one of our boilers for a couple years and he's done graduated now and everything. Uh, so, um, you know, he did a good job handling it and loading the boiler, uh, boilers. Uh, let's see if there's anything else I can touch on here. Uh, oh yeah, okay, so um, our, uh, our schools don't exactly have a sports fund. So if they want to play basketball, they want to do volleyball, they want to do wrestling, everything is off island. They have to come up with their own travel funds, which usually means the parents or they do fundraising. So we do a lot of fundraising, firewood fundraising, where the kids are actually helping harvest the wood. The money that they earn harvesting the wood goes back into the sports fund, which then pays for their travel so they can go to these other islands and, and go wrestle and, and play basketball and, and sorts of things. So, uh, well, I probably already touched on the students running the boilers. Uh, we also have, um, <laughs> we also have some of our, uh, uh, teacher housing units, because we provide housing for all our teachers, so we have tied in our teacher housing units to these wood boilers, and on some of our sites, the teachers are running the wood boilers for free heat down in their house, and they will never have to go out the road and get another piece of firewood themselves again. We provide the firewood, they run the boilers, heat the school, they get free heat in their housing units, so, you know, that alone probably saving them anywhere from four to five hundred dollars a month and just heating costs in the teacher housing units so um, uh, adult fuel filters yeah uh, students learn scheduling and responsibility that's really good we we've had uh, had some trouble in the beginning with um, we were paying our students by the hour and so you know smart little guys figured out that you know, if they don't run them boilers up to temperature, well, they can get paid to throw wood in it all day. All right, so we switched to a day wage, 
you know, after that. And, and now they're more in a hurry to get the boilers up to temperature so they can have the rest of the day off. So, you know, they figured it out real quick that they could really milk that out. So, you know, we put an end to that. And, uh, uh, this, this is one of our greenhouses here. Um, there's a, a curriculum that is just being started for the, you know, the greenhouses are new to the school, so they're still coming up with curriculum for the students. Um, these greenhouses would have never been possible without biomass heating because there's no way we would ever buy diesel to heat a greenhouse. The, the heat loss and, the, and, the, and we're not really making a lot of money with the greenhouses. We're breaking even. We are supplying lunch programs uh, with fresh vegetables and things um, of that nature and also you know, sell a little bit to the grocery stores. There's also a farmer's market once a week in the summer when, when they're really producing. Um, right, yes, we have um, unit heaters. You can see, uh, let me see, get the old laser pointer out here. There's one unit heater right there. This is actually a fresh air intake. Um, so uh, I want to emphasize that these are also aquaponic greenhouses. So we use fish to fertilize the water that the plants use that fertilizer. So we could say it's organic, but until we go through all those regulations, we can't. But it is. You know, they, they feed the fish organic fish food, the fish poop in the water. The water gets circulated through the plants and the plants eat it. So, um, you know, it, it was uh, real hard to start one of these because I, there isn't a whole lot of biomass aquaponic greenhouses out there. Um, so when, when our first greenhouse, what we did is we did a, a radiant pad underneath the fish tank and we have 700 gallon fish tanks in there. So, you know, with, with a, um, uh, a sensor in the fish tank, and the fish tank gets cold, the hydronic heating comes on underneath the cement pad under the fish tank, heating the fish tank, heating the water for the rest of the system. Well, that was the first way to do it, and uh, we found out later probably not the most efficient because our latest greenhouse, we did what I call pond water. We run the pond water right through a heat exchanger. You know, so you have the wood boiler circulating on this side and the pond water circulating on that side and we're getting a lot um, more even heat, so to speak, you know, be in the ponds. Okay, it's a gravel floor in there and then we have all raised floating beds. I don't know if we have pictures of that, but they use the thin styrofoam you know, with plugs in it, and we have big floating beds. We also have a couple dirt beds that are also circulated by that too. So, I mean, I could go on and on and on about these greenhouses and, and all the different ones and different things we've tried and how we've really gotten better over the years. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah gong show. So, <laughs> uh, here, here's some of our produce. Um, this was one of our greenhouses, one of our first ones. We, we went with um, uh, hydroponics. So this is an, uh, actually uh, was a hydroponic setup. Since then, it has been converted to aquaponics. Um, we had uh, trouble with the um, hydroponics, being if something went wrong in the system, it was a matter of hours before the plants were dried up and dead. So when we went to the floating raft systems, if your, if your pump goes out, if your aerator or something goes out, everything is still floating in water. You have some leeway there to either get your pump fixed or get your, you know, your cooling fans back on or, or something. They wouldn't dry out instantly. So for us, it was a little bit more, um, I want to say, um, not maintenance free, but you, know, you have a little, little, yeah, go ahead. Okay. No, 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 not. We had some die last year. I used them for fishing bait. They worked really good. Um, so, uh, but uh, we have really um, strong fish farming laws in Alaska. So we're right now we're only being allowed to do goldfish. In the future, I think we would like to do tilapia or um, uh, catfish or something like that. But the fish farming laws are. 
you know, ho hopefully someday our district will find a loophole because we aren't actually farming fish to use the fish, we're farming fish to use the poo. You know, so we aren't raising them and selling them and eating them. You know, we're, we're using them to grow vegetables. So maybe in the future they will work with us a little bit more on that. But, you know, it's, in the beginning it's a real slow process. You know, I could touch on that. My wife runs this, but I believe it is um, uh, between 70 and 75 degrees. Megan, is that where you run your water normally? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, like, uh, you know, our, our greenhouse in Kaufman Cove is, you know, um, it's 7,000 square feet. We have 500 square feet of growing space, and you need a ha uh, one pound of fish per one square foot of growing space. So our fish tanks have to have 500 pounds of fish in them, you know, which that's a lot of fish when you're getting goldfish this big and trying to raise them. You know, and it takes a long time to build. We aren't even up, up nor close to that right now with, with the goldfish. So we're, we're, we're growing in sections in, in that in particular greenhouse. So. Okay, so they are selling um, local produce, you know, at the grocery stores, um, cafe, you know, so there is a little bit of income coming in, you know, whatever income comes into the greenhouse goes right back into the school district, going right back into the kids, sports funds, um, whatever, so it's, it's, it's a really good cycle there. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's a, the Thorn Bay Cafe. Uh, they were selling, you know, vegetables to them. Okay, uh, let's see. Student involvement. I mean, pretty much sums it up right there. I mean, the students are involved with just about every aspect. You know, we've even had them involved in, in the construction. You know, our superintendent is always preaching student involvement. So whenever we can get a student out there to hammer a nail or help pick up something heavy, we, we always do that. Um, uh, I think they are uh, trying to figure out how to work on a pump right there. So I'm really good. All right. What do you think, Walter? <laughs> that was great. Okay. All right. <laughs> As an outsider, not living in the school district, I just was totally impressed at how they got the students involved in every aspect. It's a real learning experience for them. And uh, it really is uh, kind of, I don't know, it's empowering to see uh, how what you can do with the construction projects and you know something as mundane as, as heating a building can become an educational experience. But back to commissioning. So <clears throat> the uh, second learning objective was to go uh, to take the lessons learned and uh, uh, record them and apply them to the next project. So the, the two of the uh, uh, lessons learned were uh, that the thermal storage was at least if as important, if not more important, than the boiler itself. And that uh, the realities of the operations, how do you keep that heat going all night? Um, and, uh, and then some, some simple uh, issues, like you can use the lower quality heat as the, as the temperature of the thermal storage degrades, it still can heat the greenhouse. This is, uh, Jonathan, what, what town is that in? That's, uh, that's Kaufman Cove. Okay. That's, that's our big greenhouse. Yeah. So, you know, here it is in construction, and here it is uh, just about finished uh, half a year later. Um, the thermal storage is what keeps the, the, uh, the greenhouses warm all night. And remember, these are manually loaded biomass boilers. So at 3 o'clock in the morning, you either have somebody out there chucking more wood in, or you have your uh, thermal storage, which is giving off heat and keeping the place warm. Are they um, gasification boilers, uh, wood gasification boilers, or just standard wood boilers? No, they're not a gasification boiler. What they, how they do run is um, once the wood is loaded in, uh, you close the door, 
and uh, I don't know if it's on a latch or on a switch, but then a force draft blower blows on the wood and it burns really hot and really clean. You can't even see the, the exhaust coming out of the stack except for a little heat ripple. There, uh, there's no ash, there's no, no soot, no smoke. Those, those are probably running right there in that shot. In this, oh, did I hit the, I didn't know I hit the button. Oh, no. <laughs> but that shot okay. right there, those boilers are probably running and you can't, you can't see the smoke coming okay. out of them. So this is the Thorn Bay boiler that, that Jonathan talked about. Um, this is the, uh, the, the module number one, this is module number two. These are the doors that they loaded the wood through and just off the screen to the right was the wood storage uh, facility. Uh, and uh, as he said, the thermal storage wasn't enough to keep the school uh, heated all night. So they rebuilt it. They, uh, they got rid of those boilers. They got some bigger ones. And this is going to be a sequence of photos. This is the new boiler room. Uh, here is a, a loading door. This is the edge of the greenhouse right there. There's a second uh, sequence. Uh, the, the, the greenhouse, all in one building. And then this is the back end. And you might notice that the wood is no longer just in piles. These are in pallets and they can be forklifted around. This is the old building, wood storage building. Here's the wood stacked up and they would drag it across from here just to, this is the boiler building right there. Uh, you were using carts then, weren't you? Pardon me? You were using carts? It wasn't, it wasn't yeah, forklifted? Yeah, yeah, wheelbarrows. Yeah, yeah it wheel wasn't forklifted. So there was a, quite a bit more muscle involved, uh, but it was close and it was uh, convenient. Uh, it, just, it was just too much because it's such a big school. How many? 500? 500 um, in the school? Oh, and, and Thorn Bay? Yeah. 75. 75 yeah. students, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's our biggest school, 75. That's your biggest school, okay. Yeah. Okay, but it's a big building. <laughs> got a gym, yeah. got a cafeteria. Okay, uh, this is what the wood storage looks like now. Yeah, quite a bit different, as you can see. And it's been palletized for uh, mechanized handling. There's the forklift. Uh, the wood storage being in the same building as the boilers themselves. They don't have to go outside and drive the forklifts on icy uh, uh, lots, parking lots, or roads. And here is the, the two boilers with the pallets right in front of them. So uh, a person loading the boilers just reaches the wood, chucks it in the burner. Reaches the wood, chucks it in the burner. Here's a... a and the next iteration of a wood storage building. This one had the walls taking off of it so that, uh, as you can see, 100 inches of rain per year. If you put wet wood inside of the building and it rains that much, how do you get all, how do you dry the wood? Well, ventilation, ventilation, ventilation. You gotta have free flow of air. You don't wanna close the doors. You don't wanna block movement of air at any time. Powered fans would uh, just cost more energy to, uh, to run and there's generally enough wind that if you can keep the walls open, the, wood, the air will flow over the wood naturally. So one of the lessons learned, and this was something I don't think they anticipated at the very beginning, is the back feed of heat. So they needed to control this, uh, the heat from going from the school back to the wood boiler at night when the, when the boiler cools off. So that's the direction it's supposed to go. The star is the, uh, the wood boiler, and the heat goes through the heat exchangers, through the piping, into the uh, heat exchangers at each school building, and then into the piping system for the school building. What you don't want to happen is this at night, where the, wood bo the, uh, the, the diesel-fired boilers are heating the water, and that heat is going back into the wood boiler building. That's, that's uh, just a waste of heat. So that was one of the lessons learned uh, uh, from experience. Other objective, uh, owner's project requirement uh, items that came up were uh, a site selection. You could see that they modified the site at the Thorn Bay project. 
to make it work better for them. They have to accommodate system growth. Not every building or every project had the greenhouse at first. And so when the greenhouse was built, they had to have room for the new boiler and the greenhouse and all the controls. The OPR needed to address the anti-back feed control and the owner's project requirement needed to uh, accommodate the balancing. I didn't really point out in that schematic uh, all of the pumps and uh, heat exchangers individually, but if you think about it, and I'm going to show you a picture of it in a minute, uh, there are a lot of parallel paths. And these parallel paths uh, could allow one heat exchanger to be doing twice as much work as another heat exchanger when they should have been equal. So in this view, I'm showing you the uh, a sort of a site plan of the village of Heidelberg. This is not the whole village, but this is where the school is. The school is right in here. I've, I've highlighted two of the buildings on their campus. This is the high school. This is the gym. The elementary school is not highlighted, but it has piping going to it. This building right here is the new boiler building and wood storage building. And I want you to focus on just this area right here because I'm going to zoom in on it right now. So there you go again is the wood uh, uh, boiler and storage building, the gym, and the high school are in blue. In order for these logging trucks to get in there, they have to have you know, adequate roads and turning radii. Uh, this is the traffic pattern. The, the truck comes in here and circulates around and goes back. Um, our prevailing winds come from the back side so they could have the front side open. And then uh, you can see the piping that runs underground to the three buildings. What's not shown is uh, uh, a T that was also put in there for some of the teacher housing. They, that was going to come in the future. I'm also going to show you this, is, uh, this eyeball that just popped up is uh, the point of view for some photographs that are on the next slide. So there's the, uh, the uh, photograph. You're looking at the high school. This is the high school right here. If you look down this way, you see the, uh, the village's uh, totem park, and you can see the, uh, the ocean water down there in the far distance. That's the direction that the truck would be coming from. And that area on the left is the area where the project was going to be built. Uh, it really worked out well for them. I think it had been a, 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 just a, a vacant lot for a lot of years. Uh, they might have had some baseball games out there, but they don't have a sports team. So it really was adaptable for the biomass boiler project. And then there is the site itself uh, from almost the same place, uh, looking at the, uh, where the, the boiler building uh, went right here. And then this open uh, lot is the turning uh, radius for the logging the delivery trucks. This is the backside of the new Heidelberg uh, wood storage facility. Uh, they uh, added all these louvers. Uh, and this is on the prevailing wind side, so the wind is always blowing on these louvers. Oops, there. And there's the front side of the same building. Uh, when the wind is favorable, they can leave those, uh, op those big doors open, and that'll allow the flow through of, of uh, ventilation. On the side closest to us, closest to the camera, is the, the two bays for the boilers, and then, of course, you can see the, the uh, greenhouse uh, adjacent to that. System growth, uh, it seems so obvious to plan extra room for extra materials or extra equipment. But it doesn't always turn out unless it's really thought through from the beginning. The items in blue, that would be here, 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 and here, are all for future when the system is going to expand. And they had to not only save room for them, but plan where the piping was going to go and the service access for all of those, and not only service, but actually uh, just to installation access. They had to be able to pull in um, through this door right here and go straight across to where the boiler is being uh, installed. So that was uh, part of the plan from the very beginning. 
Now this anti-backfeed control, uh, in these small villages, there's, a, there's not an ample resource of highly technically, uh, technically skilled workers to run uh, building automation systems or troubleshoot them if something goes wrong or even recognize if something goes wrong. So we try to keep things as simple as possible. This was real simple uh, once, we, once we got our, our heads wrapped around it. Um, when the green star is warmer than the blue star, we turn off the pumps. That's all it takes. Okay, that's simple uh, anti-backfeed control, and that could happen automatically at 2 o'clock in the morning. And when, the, uh, uh, when, the, uh, uh, when Jonathan shows up the next morning, uh, he'll find out that the, boilers, the, the, the diesel boilers have been running for an hour or two, and uh, then he'll get the, the wood-fired boilers stoked up, and, uh, and then it'll take over as soon as it gets hot. Flow balancing, all of those uh, parallel circuits uh, uh, can be problematic. So we made sure then in the design that there were lots of peats plugs and thermometers and that uh, the, uh, the test and balance was, uh, was done uh, accurately in the beginning and that it was also verified during the FPTs. Um, the fourth learning objective really is sort of a recap of everything we've been talking about, and that is to get all of those lessons learned and all those requirements into the owner's project requirement. Now, this is where I got to talk about Jonathan and his experience with having done six of these projects. When he called me up and said, hey, we're going to do a seventh one, I want you to come look at the site. We went down there, and he had no idea that he had learned all these lessons. I mean, he had a vague idea, but he didn't know specifically each single thing that he had learned from one job to the next. So we just sat and talked for two days about, well, what about this, and what about that? He goes, oh, yeah, you know, we need that ventilation. Oh, yeah, well, you know, we need to be able to get in here to service this thing. And uh, uh, the, the, the storage tanks have to be big enough. And it just went on and on and on for two days. Those were the, the uh, owner's project requirements that the, an owner who has got some experience actually has in their head. And, and I think it's the commissioning agent's responsibility to try to, try to pull that out, extract it, uh, learn from it, get it written down so that those can be the things that the design is compared to. When we do a design review, we're not you know, applying our own personal engineering judgment. What we're doing is we're, we're comparing it to what the owner actually wanted. And that's, that's crucial. We just, uh, if the owners don't get what they want, then the commissioning has, hasn't done everything that it could. So um, our summary is uh, the design fame com commissioning does help the owners get what they want. And it helps them uh, consider all the different aspects of how it's going to affect the building. And, you know, how's it going to affect the community? How's it going to affect uh, the ability to load firewood or, uh, or service the equipment when it breaks down? Uh, commissioning, I mean, uh, communicating the, uh, the OPR to the designers. That's, I mean, communication, everybody says, oh, it's easy, just communicate. Well, I think that's actually the hard part. Good communication is really quite hard. Uh, you can say it one way and another person can hear it another way. Uh, and there's lots of jokes and stories about that, but it's true. And so you try really hard to get it right. Uh, learn from that experience. And after this job, Jonathan, your job is to update that OPR. Yes, sir. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we're going to learn something from Heidelberg. And, uh, you know, next it'll be... Kassan maybe, or some other, you'll be rebuilding Kaufman Cove. I don't know what, but something will be happening next. We just keep getting better and better at these things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, my grandpa used to say, it's okay to make mistakes so long as it's a different one every time. <laughs> well, I think that's what we're talking about here. <clears throat> and uh, you have to develop the, the criteria that you measure against when you're doing the design review, when you're starting up the building. Uh, you know, what is that uh, success criteria? Well, maybe the thermal storage lasts for 
eight hours on a cold winter night. Maybe that's, that is a measurable success criteria. So there's an example. And then improve. Maybe it's not eight hours. Maybe it's six. Maybe it's ten. But uh, you keep improving as you go. So I want to thank you for attending our session about uh, commissioning a community biomass boiler system. Uh, and I would open it up to questions now uh, for Jonathan or me. Uh, yes. Jonathan. We have a couple different, uh, you know, our, our wood boilers, we run up to 185 degrees, but some of our facilities are low temperature. So we use a three-way valve and knock her down to 120 or 130 and, and send it out with like, in, in the greenhouses, of course, you know, you don't want the water over 75 degrees. So, you know, with our boiler being at 180 and we're heating the water to 75, of course, it's another three-way valve and, and, and we temper the water down. Um, a couple of our sites are high temperature, so we don't temper it at all. You know, we just send it straight over and send it straight on into the school, so yeah. Uh, well, we use a lot of Honeywell, some Tecmar, you know, um, control contractors. Um, yeah, two of our two of our facilities have been built in the past ten years, so they're they're pretty high tech, and you know, probably um, with this what what we've been talking about now. If we built a new school now, knowing what I knew, what I know now, what I didn't know then, we wouldn't go quite as technical with our control systems because you know the the minute something goes down that I can't fix it costs ten or twelve thousand dollars to fly a guy down from Anchorage to come down and yes yeah yeah I I am personally when I'm installing I like Honeywell I understand their controls and you know I use all Honeywell three-way valves and zone valves and all that sort of stuff yeah are, are there the ones with the our orange label? Yeah, I think they're a blue, box. blue box. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. No. Mainly we use hun Honeywell because that's that's what I'm used to, but might not be the best. Yeah. Yes, over here. How do you maintain 185 when like, my fire I'm sorry. How do you maintain a 185 with a, you know, a wood-burning stove that's at 600 Right, okay. Um, so we don't exactly maintain it. Um, we'll go ahead and let it rise and drop. Um, so, you know, the, the boilers run wide open. They heat the water up as fast as they can. So we usually heat the water up at 185. Let, let the fire go out, and we have such a large thermal storage that sometimes it could take up to 24 hours where that boiler um, actually cools down to 165 degrees. And then we build another fire, heat it back up to 185. So we do have, we do have a variable there. So, What's your thermal storage? Just the water? The oh, the yes. Mm -hmm. um, so our, our, our boilers are, uh, if, they're the, if they're the model 3000s, they have a 3000 gallon storage tank built into them. And then the, the 2000s, which are, we have more of those, those have uh, 2000. They're actually a big water tank with a wood stove inside of it. So, you know, the, the thermal storage tank and the, and the, the wood burning chamber is, is in the same unit and comes together. So. Hey, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. I just put one up here. Okay. So what you're looking at, this square frame is a box that's stuffed with insulation. And around this uh, dark area is the, is the uh, uh, firebox. This firebox goes in four feet, maybe? Yeah, maybe not even quite that, about okay. three feet. About yeah. three feet. Mm -hmm. And the whole boiler itself is about 10 feet long. Mm -hmm. So it's just a big tank. A big wa an open water tank uh, with uh, with this boiler or burner uh, chamber firebox submerged in the water. Um, they also are a uh, non pressurized vessel, so mm -hmm. they have a basically an open manhole cover on top. You know, you don't ever have to worry about them uh, blowing up. You know, um, you, we I think 
most of us probably know what a relief valve is, you know, a pressure relief valve. These do not have pressure relief valve. Um, Cause they're a non-pressurized vessel, we're allowed to put them right next to a school. You know, there's, there's no explosion danger uh, on them, so. Yes, right here. I'm sorry, my hearing's going bad along with my back and my knees. <laughs> so what do you do for prevent the deforestation? All the roots you can the wood or deforestation. Oh deforestation. Okay. Well for one thing we live in a in a rainforest. Uh we're using a lot of, of, of wood that's already been logged because we're a big logging community there. So, you know, there's a lot of when, when they're done taking all the prime wood out for lumber, they leave behind all the uh, stuff that ain't so good for lumber, but it works great for firewood. So there hasn't been a whole lot of deforesting going on for our wood boilers. We're actually reclaiming stuff that is uh, being left behind by, by uh, logging you know, outfits and they're actually doing a lot of the deforestation. Does the, does the water coming replant? No, we don't replant up there. Don't have to. Yeah, it's just, it's just massive trees growing everywhere, all kinds of rain. So yeah, there's no replanting going on on our island at all. So, yeah. Yeah. The fish? Uh, you know, I think they've come all over from like Seattle, from Anchorage to, you know, they're actually right now, they were just successful with breeding goldfish. So they have a couple of tanks with hundreds of little babies in them right now. So they've gotten into go ahead and breeding them. But, you know, my wife could probably touch on where they're getting the fish from and stuff a lot better than I could. I'm, I'm more the build it and hand them the key and go on to the next one. So... Um, oh, the food. Where are you getting your food at, Megan? Um, in Alaska, there's a very large salmon um, hatchery system going on. Believe it or not, it's not farmed salmon, but they, they raise uh, king salmon and silver salmon to about finger long size or fry size, and then they release them. And we've actually developed a really nice partnership with the uh, hatcheries, and they've been donating a lot of fish food to us. Um, I recently had this mold get into some fish foods. I just went on Amazon and had a bag shipped up. But the hatcheries have been really nice working with our, with our district program. Okay. Well, one more question, and I think, I think we're out of time. Go ahead. It, it's not a problem, but we do lose some water and we do have some evaporation. Um, typically, I think we maybe add about 200 gallons per school season to these boilers because they do evaporate off and then it's just, it's as simple as taking a garden hose and putting it in the top and filling it back up to the float switch. Right, right. And it has a, it has a manhole cover that sits over the tank itself, but it's not bolted down, screwed down. Um, if these things, um, if, if, if you miss your, 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 you put a little more wood in it when it gets to 185, then it's gonna come up to 220, it's gonna boil. Water's gonna come out the top, it's gonna look scary, it's gonna freak you out, but um, you know, basically just turn the boiler off let it boil back down, it'll be just fine the next day. It's doing what it's supposed to be doing. But it, it's pretty scary when it does boil over. It looks <laughs> like your building's on fire, there's steam coming out everywhere, and you know everybody in town races down there and tries to save it. So. All right, we're out of time, I'm sorry. Uh, we have to make the, uh, room for the next group. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.